on the wall. I'm John Scott, Vice President-elect Mike Pence, predicting we will get more important announcements today after Mr. Trump said he plans to nominate Georgia Congressman Tom Price, a longtime critic of Obamacare, as Health and Human Services Secretary, amid high drama over who will fill a very prestigious job as Secretary of State. This is Mr. Trump gets ready for a follow-up meeting just hours from now with one of his fiercest critics during the campaign, Governor Mitt Romney, the former Republican nominee, while some members of his inner circle openly criticize that option. Later today, Mr. Trump plans to sit down with another contender to be America's top diplomat. Let's uh, get the scorecard from Peter Ducey. He's live at Trump Tower in New York City. Peter. John, the president-elect says that he picked Congressman Price to head up HHS so that Price can help him replace the Affordable Care Act with something else. That, of course, cannot happen until the ACA is repealed. And that's where Speaker of the House Paul Ryan comes in. Ryan just said this, quote, We could not ask for a better partner to work with Congress to fix our nation's health care challenges. This is a cabinet-level job, so the Georgia congressman must be confirmed by the Senate before he becomes HHS secretary. And the top Democrat in the next Senate, New York Senator Chuck Schumer, is firing the first shots in what looks like it could be a bit of a nomination battle. Schumer says this, quote, Congressman Price has proven to be far out of the mainstream of what Americans want when it comes to Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, and Planned Parenthood. The president-elect is also making waves for an early morning tweet where he condemns flag burning. He has a threat for anybody that burns a flag, even though that is a constitutionally protected form of protest. The president-elect wrote this, quote, Nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship, or year in jail. Just hours before his meeting with Mitt Romney tonight about the vacant Secretary of State job, we do also have some foreign policy news. Iraq's Prime Minister said this morning that Trump called to pledge more logistical support in their fight against ISIS, according to a report by the AP. This Romney meeting is going to be over dinner tonight. And spokesman Jason Miller revealed this morning on Fox that his colleague, Kellyanne Conway, had the president's blessing to go on the Sunday shows this weekend and express a hypercritical view of Mitt Romney. Miller did not say that the president-elect ordered Conway to go out and blow up a potential top diplomat here in a few weeks, uh, but he did say that the president-elect had a heads up and didn't do anything to stop Conway. John? Well, it's an interesting dynamic at work there. Peter Ducey, thanks for updating us. Let's bring in Charlie Hurt, columnist at the Washington Times, and A.B. Stoddard, associate editor and columnist at Real Clear Politics. Welcome to you both. A.B., I was just Thanks, reading your, your article today. You described the transition as a circus-like atmosphere. Why is that? Well, you saw Donald Trump allow, I mean, there's definitely been an orchestrated effort to uh, torpedo Mitt Romney with Newt Gingrich, uh, Mike Huckabee, Co Congressman Chris Collins, uh, who's uh, one of the earliest, the earliest backer in the Congress, for Donald Trump and is uh, on, her, chairing up one of his leadership teams, and then, of course, Kellyanne Conway. So when Donald Trump told Joe Scarborough of MSNBC that Kellyanne Conway had gone rogue and he was, quote, furious, and that the staff was, quote, baffled, he threw Kellyanne Conway under the bus, and I think it's shameful. This is a bunch of reindeer games that doesn't befit um, a team trying to put together a, our next government when we have really intractable problems to face. I think it could have been handled a lot better. I'm sure he wanted to get his revenge on Mitt Romney. He could have done it privately by considering him for the job and telling him in private he could go to hell. But he didn't. He chose to drag it out in public. And if he tells him at dinner tonight that he has the job, I think I'll have a heart attack. <laughs> okay. We hope not, A.B. Uh, we, we only want good help for all of our guests. But you did, use, you did your, use reindeer games that it's not even December yet, Charlie, and I'm wondering if you agree with that assessment, of A.B.'s assessment of Trump's handling of the transition thus far. Well, first of all, I, the last thing I would want is for A.B. to have a heart attack. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I, no, I think all this, I think it's absolutely fine. I mean, when, uh, you know, we were promised in this, the current administration to have the most uh, open uh, 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 and clear administration in history. We've had anything but. It's probably the most closed administration that we've ever had in history. And so a little, uh, a little infighting that gets spills out into the open, I think, is absolutely fine. And then as far as, you know, uh, uh, Mitt Romney's feelings are concerned, you know, I mean, the guy, he, you know, this is a guy who lost 
in a, an election that he should have won. Uh, he did that was a huge the biggest disservice possible uh, to, to to Republican voters in particular. Uh, and so, you know, you know, for him to to spend the last year doing everything he could to delegitimize Donald Trump uh, and, and in the process insulting all of his supporters, uh, suggesting that he didn't have the te he shouldn't have even been running for president, and and do everything he could hand the presidency to to uh, Hillary Clinton. You know, of course, it's, so what? He gets beat up a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't be that surprised if he winds up getting it. But I think that the important thing there to remember is what that says about about Mitt Romney himself. That's how desperately he wants to be part of. Why would you not of, be surprised, Charlie? Because I think a lot of people when you talk about the you know the the chatter in class, so the, the folks yeah. that we trust to give all of the analysis, it seems the consensus is it would be surprising. I mean, A.B. worried talking about her health. So what, what <laughs> for you, why would you not be surprised? Because I think A.B. is exactly right about one thing. I think there's a genuine dis, uh, uh, disagreement among uh, Trump, you know, within Trump land. But I also think that, that, that Donald Trump is hearing from voices uh, in his, in his uh, team that says that, he re that Mitt Romney really would be a good pick. And at the end of the day, if, if Mitt Romney picks him, uh, it's going to, you know, it, it'll be sort of, you know, it'll be not only uh, Mitt Romney kissing the ring, but then he'll have to work for him for four years. And that'll be, uh, you know, I'm sure Trump would enjoy that as well. Well, it's, yeah, I, I wonder, A.B., if this is about not having a complete understanding of President-elect Donald Trump, the analysis of him. I know you're critical of him during, during this time. But here's just a, a quote, quote from Real Clear Politics this morning. I thought this sort of summed up the feeling that continues to come from New York City and Washington, D.C., about Donald Trump. And is this, if a transition process can suggest the flavor of the administration to come, many political professionals now predict a wildly unconventional White House mm -hmm. at the highest levels with a tinge of chaos. So it's you know, slightly negative. We, pe people did not understand Donald Trump as a candidate, and they seem to not understand him now as president-elect. Perhaps, you know, again, the chattering class is missing something where the rest of America isn't. Look, I think that people are looking for reassurance that Donald Trump doesn't want to be a chaotic president. He was a chaotic candidate. He struck the right tone on election night. He said some things in some interviews that are reassuring. But this kind of conduct, his sort of managerial style where he fosters and fuels feuding factions and he creates a lot of drama and all of this tweeting, which is completely designed to divert our attention away from the fact that he has horrible pile of conflicts of interest to deal with between his businesses and his job as commander in chief. They're totally in conflict with each other. He has this looming responsibility of creating a, an appropriate separation between the two. He's not giving us any assurance about that. People are worried that this is going to be a kleptocracy. He's just not doing in this transition time the pivot to sort of reassuring people that this job is really about us and it's not about him. And so everyone can say that everyone's in a, in a bubble not figuring out the magic of Donald Trump, but the chaos is unnerving. People want to see a peaceful and calm transition to power. They want to see him to put together a government, again, that can solve our problems here and abroad. And they want reassurance okay. from a candidacy that was very do chaotic. Do they, Charlie? Or do they want a little bit of chaos, considering everything they've watched in D.C. over the last eight years? Honestly, Jenna, I think that the American people feel like Washington already is a kleptocracy, has been a kleptocracy for a long time. They're sick and tired of it. And the reason they got And so another is such one would be great. <laughs> no, no, not that at all. They, but they are eager to have uh, chaos in Washington. They're desperate for chaos in Washington. And that's why they voted for Donald Trump in the first place. And that's why I don't think that this bothers them at all. I think that they think it's absolutely terrific. The only people that, that are upset about it are people, either, you know, establishment people that, that uh, uh, are politicians already here or the, the people that, that study this as closely as so many of us do. Uh, that we think there's something precious about it. People don't think there's anything precious, anything really worth saving uh, uh, about uh, so much of the politics for the pa of the past 20 years. We didn't get to the burning question as to what they'll be eating for dinner tonight, Mitt Romney and Donald <laughs> Trump. We'll save that for the next segment. <laughs> there will definitely be a, a, a plate of crow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. A.B. Charlie, good discussion. Thank you very much. Always great to have you. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. Brazil's president declares three days of national mourning there after a chartered plane carrying a Brazilian soccer team crashed in Colombia. Eighty-one people on board, only a handful of them survived this horrific crash. The team was heading to a tournament final after a fairy tale season. Phil Keating, live in Miami with more. 
Beyond devastating, John, 76 people confirmed dead. That number could still rise. Around 10 last night, the pilots of this incoming charter plane radioed an electrical emergency, and then all contact was lost. Just a horrible scene there in the mountains, the darkness, as dozens of rescuers worked through the night, struggling to find and pull survivors from the thousands of pieces of wreckage. So far, at least five did survive, but they remain in critical. Very difficult just to get to that plane in the mountains, muddy roads, and the rain pouring down. The charter plane carrying the Chapaquense Soccer Club had departed Santa Cruz, Bolivia, and was almost to the Medellin, Colombia airport when it crashed. Almost the entire soccer team was on board this plane, and here they are on the plane as they were about to take off, so excited on their way to play Atletico Nacional of Medellin. That in the Copa Sudamerica finals, scheduled for tomorrow, now delayed. Ohio State University police officer is being hailed as a hero for putting a quick end to a possible terror attack that left 11 people hurt. The officer was investigating a gas leak nearby when a student drove his car into a crowd, got out, and started stabbing people. That officer, you see on your screen, reacted immediately, fatally shooting the Somali-born U.S. resident. And the whole thing was over in less than a minute. There's already police there, and the police were there like instantly. I think I think the emergency service is a great job. Like they were there like that. Well, the attacker was identified as an Ohio State student who may be linked to a Facebook rant against U.S. foreign policy posted just minutes before the incident. Our chief intelligence correspondent, Catherine Harridge, joins us live from Washington with more on what we know about the suspect. Catherine. Well, thank you, Jenna. Two law enforcement sources tell Fox News that Artan came into the United States as a Somali refugee and was granted status as a legal permanent resident. In August, Ohio State student newspaper The Lantern ran an interview with Artan, who identified himself as a Muslim. He said he was looking for a place to pray. That's clearly not him. That's Tashfeen Malik and Saeed Farouk from a different terrorist attack. I'm going to keep going here. We're told this morning that there is no evidence Artan had any help when he drove that car into a crowd of students and then got out wielding a knife. Both of these methods were recently promoted by ISIS online, and investigators are working on the premise that it was not a coincidence. A senator on the Homeland Security Committee said this morning there's a lot more to learn. We've got to find out what signs were missed in this process and how do we stop this in the days ahead. And this is one of the most difficult cases. There are other signs that have got to be there. We've got to know from the Muslim community how this is happening and why it continues to happen this way. And Fox has confirmed that the FBI has possession of Artan's electronics and the Bureau is getting the necessary authorities to exploit them. The focus is on this recent ISIS propaganda videos and also whether Artan was following them, Jenna. Let's talk a little bit more about the social media posts. One of the things we were curious about as a, as a team was any sort of connection to Anwar Abulaki because that's been reported. What, what do you know about that, um, Catherine, and, and what is important to watch with these social media posts? Well, Jenna, Fox News confirmed this morning that there is a reference to the American-born cleric Anwar Abulaki in the suspect's social media postings, and he refers to the cleric as a hero. This is significant and we're told deeply concerning to investigators because it's another piece of evidence suggesting Artan was self-radicalized. Fox's ongoing reporting has shown that Anwar Alalaki, who was killed in a 2011 drone strike, is the father of the digital jihad. This booking photo is from 1997 in San Diego where he was picked up for soliciting prostitutes. Even despite this arrest, to this day, Alaki's radical teachings are consumed by those who follow al-Qaeda as well as ISIS. The New York, New Jersey bombing suspect, Rahami, who was charged just this month with terrorism, was also a follower of the American-born cleric based on his notebook obtained by Fox News. The Alaki threat is also seen in the domestic terrorist attack last December in San Bernardino, California, by Saeed Farouk and Tashfeen Malik, who opened fire at a county health office, killing 14 and serious seriously injuring 22 people before the couple were killed by police. So you see alaki has been dead for five years, but he continues to resonate with those who become self-radicalized, specifically uh, on the web, Jenna. We're going to be talking more about this. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. The final session of the lame duck Congress underway. There is a whole lot to get done, with lawmakers now facing a deadline to keep our government running. But that is far from the only thing on their to-do list. We'll get into that. Then the push for recounts in three key states rolls on. The latest on those efforts to verify U.S. election results. Next we're going to be told that not only were the Russians engaged, 
but that there were Martians who were secretly voting in a variety of hamlets, and they were all right-wing Martians. Right now, the final work session of the lame duck Congress, and we're live on Capitol Hill where there is a whole lot to do with lawmakers now facing a December 9th deadline for a spending legislation that would keep the government running. But that's far from the only thing on their to-do list. They're also trying to finalize legislation to address the Flint, Michigan water crisis, while also working to pass a bipartisan bill to promote medical research and innovation. But well, the push for recounts in three key states moves forward in an elect Trump's victory. Uh, Green Party candidate Jill Stein is asking for a recount in the states, which include Wisconsin. Wisconsin is set to begin its recount on Thursday. But Stein's recount push in Pennsylvania has hit a little bit of a roadblock. This while the Clinton campaign has joined the effort, and Stein said last hour she doesn't agree with Hillary Clinton's take on how to move forward. I don't agree that our priority here is simply a smooth transition of power uh, if that power uh, is not, um, what shall we say, if that transition is not verified. Yes, absolutely. And if we find evidence of, uh, of a systemic problem, then we will be pushing to expand this recount into other states and across the political spectrum. Joining me now with his reaction, Newt Gingrich, former Speaker of the House and a Fox News contributor. We also want to mention author of a new book, Treason, which, as I was looking up, Speaker Gingrich, is a fiction. But uh, in, the, in the description <clears throat> on Amazon.com, it says this. Treason is a story of a nation fighting for its life, not only against outside threats, but also against an internal threat. Now, in this case, it's terrorism in your book. But that's what Jill Stein says. She, she doesn't want an internal threat. That's what she's saying. That's what she's fighting. What's your take? <laughs> Well, let me say also that, that tragically, uh, the killing, uh, or, the, or rather the knifings at Ohio State resemble part of what we have uh, in treason, which does deal with international efforts by Islamic supremacists. Uh, I, I would say that Jill Stein represents sort of the nut wing of American politics. Uh, notice that there is not a single state in the country, not one, where a recount would allow her to win. I mean, she got so few votes everywhere that there's not a single state where she's in contention. You know, she'd be lucky to get into third place in a couple okay, of places. Okay, but she says that's not her priority. She's not doing it so that she could win. She's saying that the priority is not the smooth transition of power. I wanted to ask you about that. We just heard her say that. It's not the smooth transition of power, but looking at whether there's a systemic issue. Well, I think it's perfectly appropriate to look at whether there's a systemic issue. Uh, the Obama White House, hardly a friend of Donald Trump, has said there's not. Uh, the state of Wisconsin's voting uh, system has said there's not. Uh, I think Pennsylvania has a lot of paper ballots. Uh, so you have to think, you know, what, what did the Russians come over and manually ballot, uh, put in paper ballots? I mean, I'm just suggesting to you, when, when the left loses as badly as they have, at every level, from, from local state legislature to governor to Congress to the presidency, you begin to get this sort of nut friend showing up. The fact that Hillary's people are associating with her, I think, tells you how desperate and how disoriented Hillary's campaign has become. And the whole thing is a joke. It's an expensive joke. It'll cost the taxpayers some money, but it's a joke. It's, there's nothing serious about this, except, of course, it generates news coverage and with 24-hour right. news cycles, well, can, can you, uh, it gives you something to talk about. Can you explain just briefly, because I think that that's certainly caught my attention, that it's going to cost the taxpayers money um, to do the recount. How does that work? Well, I mean, she can, in some states, she, she can file and she has standing, and they'll go, as, and because she's a candidate, and they'll, they'll bring in people who will do the recount, uh, and they will charge the cost of doing the recount. And it's not, a, you know, it's not like it's a terrible burden, but it just tells you that we're in the silly season, uh, which, by the way, is compounded by uh, having Congressman Keith Ellison as the front runner for the uh, Democratic National Committee chairmanship. I mean, th these are things that don't happen when parties are healthy and when movements are healthy. But the left is in the process right now of, of sort of spinning out of control uh, and, and getting goofier and goofier. Well, it's not just the left. As we take a look at what, you know, the way that Donald Trump was treated uh, during the campaign, he had plenty of critics that were coming from the right as well. And at the top of our program, I'm not sure you saw Speaker Gingrich, but we had a really interesting debate about how a transition of power is supposed to go. And I asked A.B. Stoddard about, about that specifically, about whether or not 
a little chaos isn't a bad thing, and chaos is a word that we were using from an article, not my own choice. Here's what A.B. had to say. I'd like to get your reaction to this. He's just not doing in this transition time the pivot to sort of reassuring people that this job is really about us and it's not about him. And so everyone can say that everyone's in a, in a bubble not figuring out the magic of Donald Trump, but the chaos is unnerving. People want to see a peaceful and calm transition to power. They want to see him to put together a government, again, that can solve our problems here and abroad. AB is not part of the left, uh, Speaker Gingrich, but this is her take on the way the transition is going. Look, what, well, first, first, first of all, you're not seeing chaos. You're seeing a massive amount of energy. Uh, this is going to be a very, very energetic presidency. Uh, he has a cross between uh, Andrew Jackson's disruptiveness and Theodore Roosevelt's constant, unending energy. Uh, and a little bit of P.T. Barnum's salesmanship thrown in. You know, that's who Donald Trump is. That's what's going to happen. He just, he just announced a very solid person in Tom Price to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. Absolutely first-class choice. He announced uh, Betsy DeVos, who is a terrific national leader on school choice to be Secretary of Education. He's working his way through a whole series of appointments to make total sense. Picking Steve Bannon and Reince Priebus to be a team was, I think, brilliant and will give him a really solid team at the very heart of the White House. So I look down, and I know a number of the people they're interviewing, these are all solid people. The fact is, Donald Trump was very successful with The Apprentice. It was a remarkably popular show. He understands the value of tension. He understands the value of showmanship. And candidly, the news media is going to chase a rabbit. So it's better off for him to give them a rabbit than for them to go off and find their own rabbit. He's, he's had them fixated on Mitt Romney now for five or six days. Uh, and I think from his perspective, that's terrific. It uh, gives everybody something you, to talk about. I, he does not think of this as chaos. He thinks of this as creativity. <laughs> Do you think, I'm, I'm just curious, Monica Crowley was speaking on Sean Hannity after you, you had your interview last night, Speaker Gingrich, and, and she said that, she believes that the American people will rise up and protect Donald Trump against the mainstream media that continues to be uh, looking for every which way to criticize him. Do you think that's true? Do you believe that the American people can protect uh, President-elect Trump? Sure. So they, they did in the election, frankly. Uh, I mean, they had the total weight of the elite media trying to destroy him, and the American people rejected their information and rejected their bias. Uh, Ari Fleischer, by the way, had a, a former uh, press secretary to George W. Bush, had a very good article in the Wall Street Journal, outlined new ways of thinking about the White House press corps, uh, and I think he's on to something. I think that uh, President-elect Trump's ability to communicate directly to the American people when he wants to through Facebook, through Twitter, uh, through a variety of mechanisms that, that aren't traditional, gives him an ability to communicate and build a majority unlike any president we've seen up till now. And I suspect he'll continue to use it. He, he is not going to fall into allowing the elite media to define who he is and allowing them to censor what the American people learn. Would you want to censor some of his tweets? I, I do think he'd be well off to have an editorial uh, function of uh, people who look at it. The one the other night on, on illegal votes wasn't particularly helpful to him. Uh, but overall, I don't want him to stop tweeting. I think that's part of who he is. Look. But well, we don't want him to stop tweeting either because we're reading it on a minute-by-minute like minute basis. Thank goodness. Well, you're giving us a lot to read. We have articles in the Washington Post. We have a book to read. We have the tweet. It's a, it's a long reading list. Uh, Speaker Gingrich, it's great to have you back on the program. We Take always look care. forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. So we just heard Newt Gingrich's Republican take on the recount effort, President-elect Trump's transition so far as well. Keeping it fair and balanced moments from now, we'll get the thoughts of a guy who's managed a Democratic presidential campaign. Joe Trippi's take, moments away. But the U.S. economy grew at its strongest pace in two years in the third quarter at 3.2 percent, fueled by strong consumer spending. That's better than expected enough from the previous quarter, uh, which saw economic growth of just 1.4 percent. Of course, this is an initial read. Wall Street's reaction to those numbers are tempered by some falling oil prices. It's something we're keeping a close eye on as we uh, edge out the year. Right now, stocks are up just slightly, up 30 points in the Dow. Uh, I, I would say that Jill Stein represents sort of the nut wing of American politics. Uh, notice that there is not a single state in the country, not one, where a recount would allow her to win. 
I mean, she got so few votes everywhere that is, there's not a single state where she's in contention. You know, she'd be lucky to get into third place in a couple places. That was former House Speaker Newt Gingrich before the break reacting to Jill Stein's rationale for the recount push. Let's get a reaction from a Democrat. Joe Trippi was manager of Howard Dean's 2004 presidential campaign. He's a Fox News contributor, of course. What does Jill Stein hope to gain from this? She's certainly not going to occupy the Oval Office. Uh, I think just building up her fundraising list uh, looks to me. Really? I mean, look, I, I agree with uh, with uh, Newt on this. Uh, the, the, she's the nutty candidate uh, doing something that's going to be a waste of time and a waste of money. And I don't think, you know, and, and there's no, no Democrats that I know of who actually believe uh, that there was anything wrong with the count, or the, and including Hillary Clinton and President Obama. Uh, and so this is just going to be, look, it's going to, the one thing I do think is it's good for uh, Donald Trump. One, it's a distraction. And secondly, it's going to prove that he, he won these states. So uh, uh, that's, uh, I don't think in the end, a bad thing for him and actually makes it clear sort of it is uh, his tweets about it are more are just playing into the distraction and and, uh, and and you know creating even a bigger distraction than it already was. Well, I wonder if it's good for Donald Trump. I mean, to her credit, Hillary Clinton said, "Look, he's our president. I disagreed with him. Mm -hmm. I've campaigned hard against him, but he's our president, and you know, let's let's hope our president succeeds." But when you raise questions about the legitimacy of the election, doesn't that just fuel the the, the protests in places like Portland that we've seen? Well, I mean, two things. First of all, Donald Trump spent a, a good chunk of the election saying it was rigged, uh, so it's kind of a little strange to then wonder why people would want to prove it wasn't or check to see what the votes were. But secondly, uh, Hillary Clinton isn't challenging the, the vote. It, this is this is Jill Stein right. doing the recount thing. And look, at that point, having been through this, I've been involved in recounts uh, from another candidate challenging an election. Um, everybody who participated has to participate in that recount. Donald Trump is going to have people in those in those precinct rooms, in those counting rooms, making sure that when someone holds up a ballot and says Jill Stein, that it really says Jill. Stein. You know, validating all of this. Mm -hmm. So Hillary Clinton's going to participate, and also Donald Trump will be. As you well know, he was excoriated when during that one debate he suggested that he might not go along with the results of the election. I think the wide presumption then was that he was going to lose by a large margin and that, uh, that he would then question the results. Well, now the shoe is on the other foot, and Jill Stein and maybe some others are, are questioning the legitimacy of this election. Um, but why should they not take the same heat that Donald Trump did during the campaign? Well, I think one, Hillary Clinton did stand by the results of the election and Absolutely conceded. And she did. Right, and so and so, uh, the problem is the Stein campaign has a right under our system to do this. I don't agree with them doing it. I think it's a waste of time, but they have a right to do it. And then once they assert that right, then both Trump and Clinton have to go through the process. Uh, and participate. It'd be crazy to not have people in that room uh, and only have one campaign and they're counting the votes with the officials. That that makes no sense. So that at that point, both Hillary Clinton and Trump have been drawn into this. I think Trump's tweets just sort of add to the distraction and keep us from focusing on, on other things that I think are more legitimate conversation points about his appointments or, or where his policies are, are, are going to go or some of the, pro, the conflict of interest issues. But um, right now we're, we're stuck with the recount distraction. Well, uh, let's talk about appointments for just a moment. Sure. It has now been confirmed that Elaine Chao is to be his nominee to be transportation secretary. She was a deputy transportation secretary in a previous Republican administration. She's also the wife, as you know, of uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Just give us your take on Elaine Chao uh, for transportation. I don't, I'm, it, by no means is that a surprise. In fact, I, I've not had been surprised by many of the appointments that uh, President-elect Trump has made. I think he's made some wise, wise decisions, keeping Steve Bannon and General Flynn uh, in positions that don't require Senate confirmation, uh, because I think they'd, they'd have trouble. Uh, but then you look at Sessions, uh, Elaine Chao, and, and uh, Price, 
uh, today. Uh, and those are people, I think, that are not going to have trouble with, uh, with getting up on the Hill, getting Senate confirmation or going through the process. So uh, I think it, the, the, the one thing that's clear, and I can't wait to see who it is, is Secretary of State. I mean, there, that really is a high wire act uh, between, you know, a fight within the party and within his own advisors about who he's going to pick. I think that one is going to be very interesting. I think people are going to be fascinated to see who Donald Trump picks. I know I am. Yeah, there have been some interesting choices so far. Joe Trippi, Fox News contributor. Joe, thank you. Good to be with you, John. A freak storm with whipping winds causing a rare and potentially fatal condition. Details about thunderstorm asthma. Next. Plus, President-elect Trump speaking out about a flag-burning controversy and clashing with the First Amendment in the process. Our legal panel weighs in just ahead. Well, another tweet from the president-elect is raising a lot of eyebrows this week. Donald Trump condemning burning of the American flag, a constitutionally protected act under the First Amendment. The president-elect writes, quote, Nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship or a year in jail. Let's get some reaction from our legal panel today. Lise Wheel, a Fox News legal analyst, and Bob Bianchi, criminal defense attorney, former head county prosecutor and trial attorney. So the constitutionality question, that's been settled, right, by the Supreme Court, Bob? This uh, issue has been settled twice by the Supreme Court. Our most sacred right in the Constitution, hence the First Amendment, is the freedom of speech. And in fact, Justin Antonin Scalia, one of the most conservative justices ever known to American jurisprudence, had indicated, while personally he's against uh, the burning of the flag, which we can all understand personally, constitutionally he felt in one of the decisions that he wrote, that is a protected First Amendment right. And actually, Lee's had a very interesting quote um, that we had yeah. discussed that Justice Scalia wrote in that decision that I think is really well, Let me give you the quote. This is from Antony Scalia, the late Antony Scalia. If it were up to me, I would put in jail every sandal-wearing, scruffy-bearded weirdo who burns the American flag, Scalia said in 2015 in Philadelphia. But I am not king. So if you had a litmus test for picking a, 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 a Supreme Court justice, Scalia would not have made it on the bench on this one issue. He said it is protected speech, symbolic protected speech, to desecrate the flag, even though he personally did not see that happen. He believed that desecrating the American flag is protected by the First Amendment. So when, when, the, when the president-elect says you ought to be punished if you burn the flag, um, does, uh, does that suggest he's going to try to put people on the court who agree with him? Well, you see, that's a great question, John, and we had just been talking right. about this. We have really taken a very strange turn politically with the appointment of our Supreme Court justices. We never wanted a litmus test. We never wanted their personal opinions. What we wanted to do is to make sure they had competence and that when they got into that, they would judge the Constitution just like Justice Scalia did, mm -hmm. put their personal preferences and political preferences aside and do it based upon what the constitutional principles at play are. Now, this First Amendment issue that we're talking about, that's been decided from the KKK right. and their right to be able to protest. Even though we the hate most, it. Yeah, the most violent. Speech. Exactly, abhorrent speech. That's what the First Amendment is there to protect. Not, you know, little puppies and kittens out there that we all love. It's about the abhorrent speech. That's what it's there to, that's, you know, the American way is to protect the most abhorrent evil speech, symbolic speech, is burning the flag, even and, though we all hate it. And appointing judges, John, as you get to get back to the question you asked before, that have ideological and political preferences in order to get them through the confirmation process is going to turn our criminal justice system upside down and very dangerous. What about one of the suggested punishments, losing one's citizenship for burning the flag? Is but that's that still, possible? That still is a punishment. Now, the only way this could change is if Congress, if it goes to Congress and Congress makes a, makes a constitutional constitutional um, uh, amendment to the First Amendment. Um, that could happen. In 2006, it got very close. By one vote, it failed. Uh, but then it would still probably go to court in a court case, and then you'd still be with the Supreme Court seeing whether or not that change to the First Amendment was constitutional. Mm. It still would end up in the Supreme Court. We can hate burning the flag, but here's the point, and I do as well. But if we, we start chilling the speech of individuals anywhere, 
we have a problem with worried about chill speech everywhere. So what happens next? What if you go to a rally? Really what burning the flag is, this is symbol. It's, it's a symbol of protest speech. against the government. What if you're a political candidate and you have a rally and you start saying the government is no good, the government is bad, the elected officials are bad. Do we start punishing that conduct as well? This is a bad uh, right. slippery, slippery slope. Can, slippery slope. We're, we're gonna slippery have slope to, argument. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Bob Bianchi. So much to talk about. Yeah, it's fascinating. Lise Wheel. Thank you both. You Thank you, Jenna. Well, Dolly Parton putting out a public service announcement today. Let's take a peek at what's ahead on Outnumbered at the top of the hour. Megan and Melissa, what do you have? As we await President-elect Trump's big dinner with Mitt Romney, Mr. Trump keeps rounding out his cabinet, naming a longtime Obamacare critic as Secretary of Health and Human Services. Could repeal finally happen? And she lost the election, but does that mean the end of the Hillary Clinton email investigation? Our hashtag one lucky guy has been leading one of them. So we'll ask Congressman Jason Chaffetz all about it. He's Outnumbered, top of the hour. Sounds good. See you then. See you then. And this is a big story. Thousands evacuated, dozens of homes destroyed as wildfires ripped through the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. The flames already causing damage. And Jonathan Series live in Atlanta with more on this. Jonathan? Yeah, the region is expected to get more rains this afternoon, which is ultimately a good thing. The problem is these storm systems have been preceded by heavy winds, and yesterday and overnight, that only fanned the flames even further, spreading the flames across a region that's been experiencing the worst drought in a decade. The fires are now threatening populated areas in the Smoky Mountains of eastern Tennessee, including Pigeon Forge, home to Dolly Parton's popular theme park, Dollywood. The country singer putting out a public service announcement with Smokey Bear. Emergency management officials estimate more than 14,000 residents and visitors were evacuated from the neighboring tourist town of Gatlinburg. They say hundreds of structures, including vacation cabins, have been destroyed. They say the fires have likely affected the large resort properties of Black Bear Falls and Westgate Resorts. So far, there are no reports of any fatalities. However, several people are being treated for burns, and at least three of those burns are reported to be severe. Jenna? Such a beautiful area, and during the holidays, as well. It's definitely a story to watch. Jonathan, thank you. A new next hour of Happening Now, Donald Trump's election already shaping events around the world. A look at what's been dubbed the Trump effect. And the Netflix docuseries Making a Murderer sparked nationwide calls for the release of this man, Stephen Avery, convicted of killing a 25-year-old photographer at his family property. But now a new book makes a compelling case that the jury got the decision right. We'll talk with the author about what he found.